Kia ora. welcome to the Gear and Report. Thanks for joining us on a Monday night. It's a big congratulations to all those New Zealand based winners over the weekend in Australia, whether they were sold, like this horse, Antino, out of the ready to runs, or trained, or bred, or owned here. We had a massive weekend. Let's hope it sets us up for a huge Everest week. Away from that tonight, we're going to talk to the architect of the most important report in New Zealand racing history, John Massara on the Gearin Report about the implementation and what he would like to see happen next for New Zealand racing. And from the big man to the little man, here he is at Cambridge, our little foal we are following through courtesy of Cambridge Stud. Well, I've got some bad news. Little man's a catchy name, but it's no longer his name. The boss, Brendan Lindsay, has renamed him. I'm not happy about it. You may not be either. Little man coming up on the show a week after his brother won the Epsom last week at Randwick. As mentioned, of course, it is Everest week here in Australasia. Far more than it usually feels like for us because we have I Wish I Win for Trackside Media and we have Jolie Star, so two of the superpowers of New Zealand racing, Waikato Stud and Cambridge Stud, going head to head. News coming out today as we show you the Everest market. I Am Me has passed her vet inspection, so she needed to gallop 1,000 metres in front of the stewards and then have a vet inspection to make sure she was good to go for Saturday after bleeding from one nostril after a recent trial. She passed that. The other news coming out about the Everest is where do they go with the Coolmore slot? They have Storm Boy there. Will they change him out for Switzerland? That may not be made till tomorrow morning, Tuesday, before the barrier draw. Intriguing time for these big high profile cults about which one starts in the Everest. The market sees, I wish I would, just drifting a touch as the three year olds come into play. The best of those maybe being Growing Empire. He's a very special horse. And Jolie Star at $8. So James McDonald confirmed to be on board her. He is I Wish I Win. He does carry the hopes of Waikato Stud and of New Zealand and Trackside Media and many people involved in that $10 million competition available on tab.co.nz. We'll have him on top. It's going to be a great story if he can pull it off the horse with so many disadvantages early in life. Flying the flag for us this week alongside Jolie Star. Man, it's going to be a race. Huge coverage coming up this week on Trackside. One of the biggest brains I've ever dealt with in Australasian racing is John Massara. Six years on from his report, which has changed the nature of racing here, we got into a range of subjects with him, including whether he has been happy with the implementation of his report. Well, look, I've watched from afar and when I go to New Zealand, I ask questions and I've got a few people there that I'm very friendly with who keep me informed. So I, I've had a certainly a casual interest at least uh, in what's happened since the report was lodged. Are you happy with how much of it's been implemented or in fact how it's been implemented, John? Well, my job was to deliver the report. I made it clear at the time to the Deputy Prime Minister, Winston Peters, that there were 17 recommendations and there were a suite of recommendations that all had to be done if we were going to get the outcome that we were seeking. Not all have been done. Some have been absolutely uh, affected. Some have been partially done and two or three uh, have not been done. So it's a mixed bag at this stage. Uh, there's more that can be done if uh, the New Zealand industry determines to do so. But at the end of the day, I've done my job and handed over what I thought needed to be done. What advice would you give now, six years later, to the bosses of New Zealand Racing, whether that be Entain, who have come on board, or in fact NZTR? I think there has to be a bit of a review of where we are at this point. Yes, the uh, commercial activities of the TAB, of your TAB, have been joint ventured, which is one of the key recommendations I made at the time, and I wasn't the first one to make those. There were previous advisors that had thought the same, uh, and some of the others. But I think it's, it's time probably to take stock now that this major one has been achieved and ensure that not the, the rest of the recommendations don't go by the by, uh, because we're getting a bit of a sugar hit with this one. 
just have a feeling that might happen. And there are certain recommendations in the report, particularly about the distribution of prize money, that I'm concerned about. Um, in what way? Well, uh, you know, this applies to New Zealand, Australia, a lot of racing countries, other than Japan and Hong Kong, which are closed control racing economies. The open racing economies, the returns to owners are paltry. In New Zealand, I've got the numbers, but they're not at my fingertips at the moment, but I would say that the median earnings per horse that races in New Zealand would be around five grand, the median earnings. Not the average earnings, because the average earnings is affected by the big races, and so it pulls the average up. The median, where half the horses earn more and half the other, the, and the other half earn less than that figure. I'm telling you $5,000. Now, your training costs in New Zealand, I'm not totally up to date with it, but I have to think they're around 30, 40,000. 30,000 a year, I would say, John. I rest my case. So there's always a, uh, an interest in announcing big races, um, create, you know, again, creating a lot of interest, giving people confidence, but you must have your eye on sustainability. If racehorse ownership bills got out of control, I own some horses and the ones I own solely, they are eye-watering sometimes. I realise obviously the returns can also be fantastic, but I don't think the days of sole ownership of racehorses are around for much longer. I, I think these uh, multiple ownerships uh, are here to stay. Um, the big patron used to own 20, 40, 50 horses I'm racing, etc. Wealthy people. Th those people are gone because uh, the cost of racing is too high, the cost of breeding is very high, and the cost of purchasing horses is very high. So we've got to be minded about this, and we've got to think about how to get around it and how to improve the sustainability for horses across the spectrum, not just at the very top end. How do you do that? Because the farriers deserve their money, the vets want and deserve their money because they went to school for 10 years to become vets, the guys who drive the trucks want their money. It feels like a lot's coming out of the kick, but I don't know how we get around that. Yeah, job. no, I understand. There's two sides of the equation. It's the cost push and the revenue side. On the revenue side, we've got to resist the temptation to have a five, $10 million race, or even in New Zealand, maybe $2 million race. We know we have to have some aspirational races. I accept that. But they've got to be within your capacity to pay. And so an aspirational race in New South Wales, say, might be $2 million or $4 million or $3 million. It doesn't need to be 10 or 15 or 20 because that draws away from the distribution to the lesser horses, of, all, of which we've all got some, which keep people in the game. Would you be comfortable then with the Everest, which is $20 million, which sounds amazing, amazing. to people amazing. walking around Sydney. Yeah. Would you be comfortable with that being $10 million? Because I presume it would get the similar field. Well, I'd be comfortable with it being $5 million. Uh, it would still get a similar field because it would be the most valuable sprint race in this country. And it would get the top field. And that, at the end, that's all that counts. I, I reckon the extra 15 if there were to be 15, but you know, there's a slot system which doesn't cost uh, racing New South Wales so much because there's external capital coming in. But uh, I think that extra money, I know it doesn't have in itself the impact that racing is wanting it to have. It will help sustainability if added to some other uh, changes that it, you could, ta it could, could take place. I know it goes against racing's history, but should the Everest be a Group 1? The Everest uh, didn't go through the gate, as I call it, uh, to put themselves in a position to get Group 1 status. Yeah. But it has proved itself to be a, a Group 1 race, well and truly. It, you know, it, it's, on, on, it's on ratings, it's the top race, and it does attract the, the top horses. Uh, and I think with the evolution of time, I think it should be a group one race. Doesn't it, as much as the pattern and, and black type is the great mountain we all try to climb in thoroughbred racing, doesn't it make a mockery of it a little bit, and I understand why, that the Everest is this gigantic race and it's not a group one. 
And does it make a mockery of where the pattern lives in the modern era? I think not, because there have been other exceptions. The Breeders' Cup is an exception to the pattern, for example. Uh, and there are other exceptions in the UK where exceptional circumstances have meant that races have got Group 1 status without having gone through the steps. So it's not something you ought to be doing every day. But I think in this case, it's justified. And I think the pattern is absolutely critical uh, for racing and for ownership. It's, it's an inexpensive way to pass on value to owners and breeders. And, and it's a super valuable uh, cataloging standard that we couldn't live without if you want to play in the international thoroughbred world and which we've all worked very hard to get Australia and New Zealand recognised internationally. And at the end of the day, when they look at a catalogue, if, if it's one X dollars, means one thing, but if it's, it's got group status, it means something else altogether. You mentioned we. Interesting term in Australian racing for this situation it finds itself in. Yeah. New South Wales itself is a bit fragmented at the moment. There is definitely a fragmentation between Victoria and elements of New South Wales. You attempted to bring everybody together uh, in a stint as the chair of Racing Australia. Do you worry that they, there may never be a united Australian racing? Uh, I think it'll come again. I, look, racing's got a national franchise. That's, a, that's something of real value to racing because you never know when your good horse will come from or where the good jockey will come from. I ask people, tell me, well, who's the leading jockey in Australia? And they say, uh, Chase McNaughton. I said, where does he come from, by the way? Little place called New Zealand. Who's the leading trainer in Australia? Our friend. Where does he come from? New Zealand as well. So You're talking the to the right the... audience, John. I, I think, am, I think the I'm, New Zealanders are going to like but this. I use that line all <laughs> over the place. So you don't know. They won't all be coming from New South Wales because that's where the big prize money is. They'll come because their talent, no one knows where the talent is, they will come from anywhere, and it's really important to have our sport followed nationally for that reason, if nothing else. Um, that's the first thing. Um, so I dream of the day that we have a unified industry. If you said to me, what's the one thing you'd like to see in racing? Unification is what I would like to see in racing. I sincerely say that to you. What's not going to help with that is the debate over Rose Hill, a very public debate in the most public of forums, your parliament. What would you do? Are you a fan of selling Rose Hill? Is there a complete no, a complete yes? I'm sure you've had a lot of time to think about it and I'm sure you've thought about it a lot. I have thought about it and uh, I've only thought about it subsequent to the offer being suggested, that, you know, that there might be an offer of X billions of dollars I hadn't dreamt before that that we might sell Rose Hill because it's one of our anchor, anchor tracks. We've only got two of them in Sydney. And for a jurisdiction of that size, we certainly need every one of those two. We need more than that. So I hadn't thought about it. But when it came along, it is a huge amount of money. And uh, I know it would provide a future fund for racing in, the fu uh, in, in future. And, and I can see all the benefits that might flow but I can't be supportive of it unless there's a solution to replace it. We would need to be given uh, a solution that stands up to replace Rose Hill with another track of equal quality, size, etc., in the same region. If we can't be given that, I don't think we could sell it because it's integral to the industry in the state. And in Australia, I would say even, so my answer is, I would sell Rose Hill for these multitudinous numbers that are being talked about. Uh, but one, I'd have to be sure that there's an alternative, a sound, firm alternative, and a plan to develop that alternative in time for the decommissioning of Rose Hill. And two, I'd still want to see the members of the ATC have the final say in a vote. I don't think that's too much to ask. We've spoken about a couple of things that go against history or history potentially changing. One thing which is ingrained in the history of the thoroughbred breeding industry is natural service, whereas obviously in other industries they do have artificial insemination. You have a wonderful stallion on the cusp 
of moving to a new level in the autumn sun, he is injured. He cannot serve me as the spring, and we're sorry to hear that. Has it made you think about whether there's a place in thoroughbred breeding for AI? Not for one minute. When tell, the, tell me why. Well, when the AI attack came on, I represented the breeders in, in, in defending the, the natural service position. And I spoke to international bodies all over the world about their thinking on it, etc. Fact is that if, uh, by the way, interestingly, I would have been the biggest beneficiary of AI in that time at that time because I had Redoots and I had Snitzel and I had not a single doubt. So, so could have set I, I could have set myself up for the next 50 years by collecting and freezing sperm. But I thought it was really in the bad, worst interest of the industry because it would narrow the gene pool significantly and... Couldn't you limit the stallion numbers that they have in New York to you, 140? You, you can't under our law. You would not be under trade practices. You would not be able to limit the numbers. If you could limit the numbers in a way which was not arguable at law, etc., then it's something you could look at. So you're talking restraint of trade. Restraint basically. of trade. If you can't limit the numbers, then it's something you can't fiddle with at all, in my opinion. It'll destroy the breed. With things like the Masara report or trying to open the eyes of Australasian breeders to Japanese horses, and there's a, a few others doing that as well, it almost feels like a, a legacy time in your career. You're looking to give back to an industry which has been successful for you. When you think about John Masara, but probably even more so Arrowfield, what makes you the most proud? Uh, when I think of Arrowfield, I don't think of John Masara. I think of my team. I think of my team now. That sounds a bit trite, people say that. I'm saying it very genuinely. I've been very fortunate along the way to be able to draw in to the Arrowfield compound outstanding people. Very good horsemen, good analysts, uh, good supporters. Uh, I've always had a great PA. I've always had uh, great bloodstock managers. Uh, I've always had terrific on the ground people there and quite a few of them Kiwis along the way, by the way. Um, and I've now got my son in a, in a critical position there. Uh, I owe them a lot because I can only be in one place at one time. If you like, I do some of the intellectualizing, but those guys are doing the work with the horses, which at the end of the day, it's what it's all about. John, there'll be people watching this who own a plumbing firm or they own a farm or they own some sort of other business. How do you do that? How do you attract good staff? Do you have to pay overs for good staff compared to market rates? And how do you keep good staff? Because some of your staff have been there for a very long well, time. I, I do it in a funny way uh, in that uh, when they sign on with me, I get them to sign a confidentiality agreement and they say, oh, well, don't you trust me? I said, I trust you implicitly. I went, oh, well, you wouldn't get to this point. But I want to be free to tell you about things that we're going to be doing that might be delicate and confidential. And I want you to know that this is important information you can't discuss with your mates at the pub. The stuff that you're going to learn in here that I don't want our competitors to know about. And so I bring them into the circle. I bring them into the circle and they enjoy what they're doing because I trust them, they know I trust them. In addition to that, I treat them all like family. I will go to the end of the world to help them if, if it'll get them out of the hole somehow or somewhere, medically or any other thing. They've got my loyalty for life. It's a two-way loyalty is the way I see it. If they're loyal to me, I'm going to be doubly loyal to them. Does anybody say no? They don't want to solve it? <laughs> no, nobody's ever said no, because they know I'm not saying this. I'm saying this to give them an understanding that you're going to come into the inner circle now, and we're going to discuss really interesting things that you can contribute to, but that have to remain confidential. Having achieved so much, we'll go back to the Masara report, do you ever think it'd be just a good time to pitch your feet up, watch the horses, have a drink, look out over the farm, rather than constantly being involved in racing Australia's and I'm, I'm sure the phone never stops and all the things that you still do. Do you ever think it'd just be nice to sit back and enjoy it? I think that, and then I cast <laughs> it away 
because I'm enjoying what I do. I'm enjoying what I'm doing. I do enjoy it. I love it. I'm, I'm, I love what I'm doing. I love, I, I'm not as active as I used to be. I've got my son there now and I've got a really good team. And a lot of those guys, you know, do, do most of the heavy lifting. I'm there at the final decision-making stage and I'm thinking all the time about ideas and, and uh, you know, directions we should be going, etc. And the fear I've got is the minute I stop that, <laughs> I'll drop off. And I'm not going to test that theory. <laughs> no, there's no future. There's no future in that future. one. Fun. We'll talk about great horses because you would have seen some great, great horses. But who's your favourite horse of yours? I think I know the answer. Oh, it has to be Miss Finland. She... I got it wrong. I was going to say Dundee. <laughs> that, well, Dundee, uh, Dundee, I love Dundee. Love Dundee. He was a machine. But he came at a later time of his career to me. And I shared it with the others. Miss Finland, I shared with two very close, long-term friends of mine. And to win the Slipper in April and win the Oaks in November of the same calendar year, 1,200 to 2,500 in Victoria, hats off. Who's the best horse you've seen in your lifetime? I'm not going back to Farlap. You Who's don't the have best to finish the question. I cried at Ascot. I cried a grown man when I saw Frankel win. I think it was a Queen Anne. I felt tears coming down my eyes out of sheer respect and joy for that horse. It was devastating. I, I can I, I could well up now. That's how much I, I think of him. He's, he's my number one too. Yes. Yeah. He's just, something very that's special. That's how they should look. And let me tell you, when I bought Dane Hill, the prince who sold us Dane Hill wanted to have five long, lifetime breeding rights to retain in the horse. And we agreed to that. One of those breeding rights, with one of those breeding rights, he bred kind than damn of Frankel. So I've got a little bit of involvement, <laughs> but not much, not much. Well, it's enough to But you know what? Right. He's bred on the exact opposite cross to Autumn Sun because he's by Galilee out of a Dane Hill mare. Autumn Sun is exactly the, the other way around, a son of Dane Hill out of a Galilee mare. What about trainer or trainers? Who are the best you've seen? Look, in my day, in my day, I have to say TJ Smith because he won so many consecutive premierships in the toughest jurisdiction in Sydney. He was a freak. That guy was a freak. Had an eye for horses beyond anything I've ever seen. At the Magic Million sale uh, many, many years ago, early on, he kept looking at a Dane Hill horse that I had and I knew he was looking at it because he'd look at him around corners. He didn't want to show me that he was interested in it. And he was very close to Percy Sykes, who was on my board, Arafield board. Percy, I said, you're our mate up there. I reckon he's after that, that horse there, that Daniel horse. Uh, and, I, and he said, uh, I'll find out. So he said, he is, and I reckon he'll be in the bidding. So I thought, well, okay, let it, let it find its own level. Anyway, he bought the horse. My wife, Christine, said, now, TJ's bought that horse. Go and get a bottle, he loves champagne. Go and get a bottle of champagne. And you three, Percy, you and TJ, have a glass of champagne to celebrate. So I, I said, look, he's not interested in that. He wants to buy other horses. Just do it, she said. I said, all right, I'll go and do it. So I'm always too busy. She said, I've got to slow down and do these things. So I did it. Went, I said, TJ, thanks for buying the horse. I wish you luck with it. I've just got a bottle of champagne to celebrate. He said, my boy, he said, that horse is the only horse in this sale that'll win a classic. Nothing like a date. Wow. The guy was a genius. What did he pay? I'd have been at 160 or something like that. You didn't stay in for a leg? No, I didn't stay in for a leg. I begged the, after his first start or second start, I begged the people that bought, it, that bought into him to buy a piece. They wouldn't sell. There was a school teacher and a coal miner that bought, that bread bought it. Uh, anyway, look, uh, he was a genius. I had him once at the farm and I had some of his retired uh, fillies there that I'd bought, not necessarily through him, but at sales, etc., and he'd walk in a paddock and he'd say, that's so-and-so, isn't it? That's Hart's Hill, isn't it? She's about 100 yards away. I said, yes. How did you know? He said, oh, I'll never forget horses. <laughs> he, 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 he was, and this is, you know, like six, seven, eight, ten years after she'd retired. He was 
he had an extraordinary eye for horses. He was a great trainer. He got them rock hard fit and they could do anything. And he proved it. Horse, Frankel, uh, trainer, TJ, jockey. The best jockey you've seen. Yeah, look, we've been we've been lucky with jockeys. There have been so many good ones. And J Max, the one at hand at the moment. The guy I liked uh, was the professor, Roy Higgins because he was a thinking man's jockey. You know, out would come the cigar, she'd sit down for lunch and he'd say, now look, I'm thinking I'm gonna be fourth on the rail, this and the other. You enjoyed the ride with him and he was very, very good at what he did. So I'd have to say Roy Higgins, but he was, he was one of the very best. It's hard to separate them in different eras. They get, some of them get opportunities that others don't. Look, horse, quality horses and numbers do make differences in determining champion, jockey's champion, trade, you know that. What's the one thing, if you could only change one, that you would want to change right now? I'm involved here in Australia, and so my mind is aimed at Australia. I would like to have a cooperative, friendly, unified industry working together, uh, competing at a level but not competing ferociously because uh, racing is a national sport and we should be competing with internationals, not with our, with our own brothers and sisters in Australia. So if we could actually get ourselves to a point of having a, a, a peaceful sort of coalition there, that would be my dream because I think a lot of opportunities aren't being enjoyed because, you know, New South Wales and Victoria and Odds and other states, etc. Uh, we need to get past that and both sides have to give something to get that outcome. That is what I would like to see. Uh, and I think it's feasible. It will get done at some stage because the alternate is pretty unpleasant, as we can see. John, thanks for being on the gear report. Thanks for the chat and, and belatedly, thank you for the Masara report. Pleasure. He's an amazing man who's done so much for Australasian racing. Great to get some of the thoughts of John Massara there. We thank him for joining us here on the Guerin Report. Well, the little man is down at Cambridge eating, and because you can't sell a horse at the sale, it's called Little Man, because he won't be little for the rest of his life, Brendan Lindsay has decided to rename him. His stable name, his paddock name is now, I know, I'm not happy about this either, He's going to be called Mickey G. So for sake of confusion, we'll call him Mickey G Jr. Yes, there he is with Mum. Mum, of course, now the dam of the Epsom winner in Curl Wolf. What happens over the next six weeks of his life or so far? Hangs in the paddock. He goes to the dairy of Mum. Eventually he gets handled by Foal New Zealand where they teach him to be in a halter and how to be around humans more. He's an absolute ripper, a son of sort of state, and we're looking forward to getting down to Cambridge Stud to see him next week. Next week on the show, though, we have one of the greats of world racing, our own Chris Waller. Oh, just a whole different level of intensity, and you don't want to let anybody down. First of all, I guess the public, but you also don't want to let the horse down either. Like, is one run too many? Do you need to be retiring now? Um, they were the, probably the, the ongoing questions I was asking myself. That's Chris Waller on the Giron Report over the next two weeks. Everest week, what happens next for you? 10 p.m. Tuesday night, we have the barrier draw courtesy of STC, Sky Thoroughbred Central, and then our preview show here, the New Zealand-centric preview show on Trackside and trackside.co.nz from 10.30 a.m. on Wednesday. Happy Everest week. We'll talk to you next Monday here on the Gear and Report at 8 p.m.